take a seat. Let's get this party started. My name's Ian Dodd, and I will be one of your two co-hosts here this morning. If you don't know what Sunday Assembly is, it is a sector community that invites any and all, as we try our best, to live better, help often, and wonder more. And one of the ways that you can help often is to move forward and to move in, because we've still got people coming in, and it looks like it's going to be standing room only today. So that's, uh, that's pretty cool. If this is your first time at Sunday Assembly, we're really glad you're here. If this is your second, or your third, or your twelfth time, we're really glad you're back. And if you're visiting from one of our sister assemblies like San Diego, Portland, and I believe Phoenix is here somewhere, we'd like to give you, there it is, Phoenix, we'd love to give you a special shout out. And we'd like to know that we thank you for making the drive and that you're always welcome here in our home, all right? For those of you who are regulars, it may feel a little bit different today. We've invited some special friends of Sunday Assembly to come in and experiment with us today. So you may notice that there's these comment cards on your chairs with three simple questions. If you could take a minute at some point to fill those out, we want your honest feedback. We want to know what your experience is here today. And you can leave those with your name tags and the pens on your way out later today. One of the special friends that we've invited in today has been coming to Sunday Assembly pretty regularly for about a year now. And he's my co-host today. Bart Campolo is the humanist chaplain at USC. And in an extraordinary act of interfaith dialogue, as of August, he will also be the humanist chaplain at UCLA. <laughs> Bart Campolo. You know, thank you. I'm, I'm very excited to be here this morning. Probably some of you that saw me in the back know that I'm very excited to be here this morning. Um, and uh, and a, a, as we get started, you know, one of the things is like, I, I, some of you probably know this about me, like I spent most of my life as an evangelical Christian. And you know, and, and it, I loved being an evangelical Christian, but when, when I left that, it never occurred to me that I would get a chance to be in a room like this one, with a group of people like you sort of getting together in a secular way to celebrate life. So I'm just, I'm so genuinely excited to be here, I, I can hardly stand it. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and I'm excited to be here, and, and, and especially at Sunday Assembly, uh, I'm so excited to be here that I was willing even to sing. Um, <laughs> no, because you, you people do sing here, don't you? Yes, 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 yes you do. And, and the truth of the matter is, is that for me, that's, for me, that's a little bit scary because I spent the better part of my life singing songs that in many cases I had a hard time believing and, 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 and in keys that I had a hard time reaching. Um, and so I, I got some scars, I got some trauma. Um, but fortunately this morning, we brought with us, I brought with me my personal choral music therapist, um, Maggie Wheeler. Um, Yes, and, and, and fortunately for you, Maggie brought with her, her her choir, the Golden Bridge Community Choir. And so, Maggie, I'm just gonna ask you to, I, I'm gonna ask you to come up and sort of tell us what I've been missing musically, okay? Yeah, right come on, go for it, okay? okay. Um, hi everybody, thank you, we're so happy to be with you here today put this paper down, shouldn't have come up with me. Uh, my name is Maggie Wheeler, this is Emil Hassan Dyer, my co-director. Uh, we founded the Golden Bridge Community Choir nine years ago here in Los Angeles to create an opportunity for people to come together and sing music to take our you know, community out of spectator status and make everybody into a participant and to, uh, to make music the making of music really accessible to everybody. Uh, there, in, in our culture, you either, you know, there's so many opportunities to make music if you read music, if you're a member of a church, if you've auditioned, if you're in the theater. And, uh, and, and we really wanted to just uh, blow the walls off of that. And that's what we've been doing for nine years here. And we're so excited that we got to bring some of our choir members here today to sing with you and to support the conversation that we're having today about community and inclusivity and um, the power of connecting with each other. 
So on that note, I'm, I'm going wel to welcome these guys up. So I was one of those kids in choir that was told, just mouth the words. <laughs> I was always flat. And so the fact that I am here and that I'm Maggie's co-director is a miracle. <laughs> uh, so um, without further ado, here is the Golden Bridge Choir. Uh, he's too humble. He's a very gifted singer. <laughs> Uh, you know, this is what we do. We just, we, we sing all of these songs that are just inclusive and celebrate, celebrating life and, and we like nothing more than to get big groups of people singing. So this next song is a song called One Heart Beating. It's written by a woman named Sue Kirkpatrick from Australia. It's in three different parts and I'm going to teach you the three parts and you all can choose which one you like best and you'll have a, a, a great support in system in the choir because they'll be doing the three parts with you. So the first part goes like this. Um, we are one world, one voice, one heart beating. We are one world, one voice, one heart beating. We are one world, one voice, one heart beating. We are one world, one voice, one heart beating. Okay, beautiful. That's part one. Part two guys it sounds like this everybody's living in this world everybody has a voice let's use it everybody living in this world one heart beating everybody living in this world everybody has a voice let's use it Everybody living in this world, one heart beating. One more time. Everybody living in this world, everybody has a voice, let's use it. Everybody living in this world, one heart beating. Beautiful, so that's part two. And the third part, the sopranos are going to help me with, and it goes, we are one world, we are one heart beating. We are one world, one heart beating. That's part three, so we'll do it again with you guys helping me, okay? We are one world, we are one heart beating. We are one world, one heart beating. And one more time for the people who like that part. We are one world, we are one heart beating. We are one world, one heart beating. You guys are awesome. Okay, so uh, let's get the first part going and then we'll add everybody in. And if you like this one, jump in with these guys, okay? We are one world, one voice, one heart beating. And you keep doing that. One world, one voice, one heart beating. We are everybody living in this world. Everybody has a voice, let's use it. Everybody living in this world, one heart beating. Everybody living in this world. Everybody has a voice, let's use it. Everybody living in this world, one heart beating. We are one world. We are one heart beating. We are one world, one heart beating. We are one world. We are one heart beating.
will be back. Wow, you guys are a tough act to follow. <laughs> we'll be hearing more from Maggie and the Golden Bridge Choir and all of you a little later in the program. But right now is one of my favorite parts of the morning. You know, Sunday Assembly is not just this monthly event here in Hollywood. For a lot of us, this is our community. We support each other, we care for each other, we inspire each other to try and make the world a better place. So we have a lot of opportunities to do that. Um, you may have seen our community table as you came in this morning. We've got people who are happy to talk to you about our new Help Often team and all the service opportunities that we have coming up. And we'd love to, uh, love to get you involved in that. But uh, right now, I want to bring up some friends who want to tell you about some really cool things coming up real soon. So I'm going to introduce Cleopatra and her mom. <laughs> to Toad Beach on Saturday, July 18, 2015 at, at 10 a.m. to clean up. It is really important to keep animals safe. Think about it. How would you like it if animals and people trashed our hometown, city, or world? Do you want to help clean up on Saturday, July 18. We, well, I do because I really love animals. I hope you come clean Toast Beach with us. Let me know if you have any questions after the assembly. You can sign up in the lobby or online. Thank you. Gina, I think you've got something you want to announce? Introducing the Tornado of Fun. Um, well, I am the Tornado of Fun, and we have a whole lot of social events um, and service events that are coming up, um, all of them on the website, and also at our community table in the back where you can sign up. I'm happy to answer questions about that. And then I also wanted to just extend the offer of community and friendship to everyone to continue after we are finished here today. Um, we'll be going across the street to the Oyster, and if this is your first time and you don't know anyone, please come find me. I would love to meet you. I'd love to introduce you to other people. I had a really hard time reaching out to people when I first came, and I would love to assist everyone in that so that we can all come and have a really great lunch across the street, and there are vegetarian options at the Oink store. Apparently the salads are really, really good. So there you go. Let's hope to see you after. Thanks, Gina. You know, in addition to feeding ourselves at the Oinkster, we also like to try and feed the larger community. So I'd like to thank everybody who brought a non-perishable item for our uh, ongoing support of the Westside Food Bank. You know, food insecurity in Los Angeles is not a one-time event, and we're trying to build the habit of supporting the Westside Food Bank through Sunday Assembly. So we've always got these boxes here, out in the lobby and, and up here at the stage, and whatever you bring, we'll make sure it gets to them uh, this next week. You know, another thing that we tried last month was our very first homegrown service project. It's called Sunday Assembly Line. And we built 300 personal care kits for the homeless. And it was so successful, it's Hollywood. We're gonna do take two. <laughs> so starting next month, we're gonna start collecting personal size, travel size toiletries again to, uh, to start getting ready for Sunday Assembly Line Part Two. So um, besides service, of course, another big part of community is the social aspect. It's just hanging out together. And so we always have a Sunday social. Next weekend, it is the uh, 19th, I believe, and our Sunday social happens on classic Venice, Venice's Muscle Beach. And uh, of course, it's always a, a family-friendly event. It's a good opportunity to just hang out with people and, and a day in the sun. Old Muscle, Beach in Santa Old Muscle Beach in Santa Monica. That's because I'm not an LA native, so how would I know? <laughs> and is Molly here? If anybody has, there's Molly. So Molly is the person to see about uh, the Sunday social next week. 
So as we came in this morning, some of you had some uh, milestones that you wanted to share. And there we are. So here's some, some things to share with the entire community. Stephanie and Nate. Stephanie just got a new job with LA Unified School District as a special ed teacher. Where's Stephanie? Kat is 42, no, Kat is 12 years old today, 42 years younger than me. Where's Kat? There's Kat, awesome. Our friend Connor Robinson is back. Connor is here for the last time before he heads off to Ghana with the inaugural Humanist Service Corps team. And finally, Victor would like us to know that he has three weeks of sobriety, managing my GAD, and it's his first time here. So let's, uh, let's make sure that Victor knows that we appreciate him being here. Okay, that's... Oh, that's right. Now is, now is the time that the kids can go, okay, the boring part's finally over. So now is the time that we get to excuse the Sunday Assembly kids to go off and have some fun in their own space. Um, our caregivers are waiting for them. They've got a place across the way. If any of the parents want to accompany them until they get settled and come back and join us, and then they'll uh, obviously be back when it's uh, time for, for coffee and snacks. So if any of you are regulars here, you are familiar with our assembler doing their best. This is an opportunity for a member of our community to, to get up and tell a story about themselves that lets you get to know them a little bit, as well as to illustrate what this community is all about. So this month we've invited my friend Shmuel Rosenthal to, to share his story. I first met Shmuel several months ago across the street at the Oinkster. And in the, in the months that he's been coming and, and become a regular face, I have gotten to know Shmuel as one of the most straightforwardly and honest people that I have met, especially about himself. So Shmuel is right here. Great. Weird. So uh, the last time I spoke in front of such a large crowd was at my bar mitzvah. <laughs> that, that gig paid a lot better, though. <laughs> so I grew up uh, about two miles from here in a, uh, an Orthodox Jewish family. So that involves uh, kosher, you know, strictly kosher, uh, no electricity on the Shabbat, uh, black and white dress, uh, gender segregated schools, all of that, synagogue three times a day. And uh, I even have note cards and no podium. So this is really weird. OK, and I'm going to tell you about a. Uh, when I was in third grade, oh, look at that. It's a, it's a miracle. Uh, I remember one teaching that uh, stands out when I was thinking about what I should talk about, because you know, I could go on all day. Uh, I was taught that uh, Esau sone et Yaakov, which basically means Esau hates Jacob, which was translated as uh, the non-Jews hate the Jews, and they want to kill you. So I remember there were very, there were two like, distinct consequences to that teaching. One was that it made me kind of, uh, it made me distrust everyone outside my group. And the other consequence was it kind of made me distrust, it was the first time I can remember distrusting the religious teaching because I thought, hmm, they seem nice enough, maybe that's bullshit. <laughs> and, So those doubts, uh, you know, they grow slowly. I do everything very slowly, generally. Uh, and they kept growing through four years of uh, high school, you know, Shiva high school, it's all male. Two years of living in Israel, going to Yeshiva, which is where they indoctrinate you further. Uh, three years of all male like, Orthodox college in New York City. And by the time I dropped out of that and I decided I had enough, I bought a Corvette and Decided to go on a five-month road trip. Uh, I was determined to like, methodically move away from that life. I didn't know how, but I was going to move toward like, a more secular lifestyle. So most of you are probably familiar with uh, Ryan Bell's Year Without God. Yeah. So I would like to say it. I think I was first. It was my five-month road trip without God. 
And I could go on and on and on, but Jeff's going to cut me off eventually, so I've got to make this short. And so I want to concentrate on the, this morning on the important part, which is where that whole journey left me, and that is uh, alone. Um, my friends were mostly Orthodox, and if they weren't, they were on the East Coast, and I'd moved back here. And my family didn't cut me off, but they didn't get it. They didn't get me, and they didn't. Some of them wondered, you know, can he still be a good person? Is he going to start killing people? <laughs> um, and I just didn't have anyone to share those, you know, the big questions with. How to live? What do I do now? And so about six months ago, uh, I came here to hear Ryan Bell. Again, Ryan Bell, because I'm a big fan of the blog. It kind of walked me through my own, my own journey. And I'd heard about Sunday Assembly before, but uh, I was hesitant, you know, a bunch of goyim in one room. Who knows what they might do to me? Uh, and so as, as introverted as I am somehow, you know, I ended up coming to hear Ryan Bell. And I'm, uh, I kind of sulked in the corner afterward if anyone went to lunch. The Oinkster met some nice people and Ryan Bell, uh, and I came back. I came back to Sunday Assembly, I came to social events, uh, thanks Gina. And the point of all of this is that I feel like I found sort of a new, a new us with a different uh, relationship with the them, which is that I don't feel scared of the them, I don't have to hate them or distrust them, and I can still be part of them. I'm doing a, a charity bike ride with an Orthodox group. I did it last year. It's a group that helps kids with cancer and their families and they don't evangelize. Um, and I can go there and be an atheist in a group of Orthodox people riding a couple hundred miles and for a good cause. And it's comfortable. And so point of all of it, I'll wrap it up. I think I just got the one minute warning and I don't want to, I don't want to hear the buzzer. Uh, <laughs> is that I'm very grateful to this community for uh, giving me a place where I can be myself and uh, strengthen the, the good values that I think I have that my old religion claimed to own, and I don't think they were right. So, thank you. Thank you. That was so great. Hey, now you've met Gina, you've met Ian, you've met Shmuel, and now what I'd like you to do is to stand up and meet the person and the people around you. Just, just say hi to the people around you. Just greet somebody if you don't know them. Stand up, just stretch your leg, say hello. All right, all right, enough, enough warmth, enough friendliness, enough kindness, enough, enough happiness, enough joy, it's over now. Let's get back to the program. No, actually, in all seriousness, Ian and I, we all, I, I hope you're having a really good time so far. I really do. Um, as you've probably figured out by now, Good times like this don't just happen. You know, like the choir doesn't just happen, and the chairs don't just happen. It takes a lot of good people to put it together. And, um, and one of the ways that all these good people, that we all work together to make this stuff like this happen is, is that we all chip in, um, you know, to pay for the donuts and to pay for the coffee and to pay for the room. And so, as you can see, the chip insters are coming in <laughs> with their... Uh, with their boxes, and evidently you can, they'll pass boxes, and you can put your money in there, or you can, they got card readers, right? Yeah, that's for the, yeah, if, if you want to do it with plastic, you know, the big box. So, so, and wait, 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 
And, and, and what I would say is give your money happily, but also give it quietly because we're going to ask my friend Ashley, our friend Ashley, who was tinkling the ivories before you came in. Ashley, will you play us something beautiful as we, as we, as we do that? Go, go play something else. Okay. Hi everybody, uh, we're back. Um, so just uh, just wanted to share with you several things about about the Golden Bridge Choir. Uh, one is that we are an intergenerational choir. We also have children who sing with us. Two of our choir children are here today, actually. But uh, so uh, yeah, we, we have all ages, and we're a non-auditioned choir. And I think we're the only non-auditioned choir in Los Angeles. So it's a uh, it's a nice thing that everybody gets to to be a part of it. And today uh, we have all of you, which is awesome. That that, that about makes up the whole choir. So. Um, uh, I'm going to hand this over to Emil to talk to you a little bit about Aye Mochinumba. Before I talk to you about Aye Mochinumba, this uh, community choir is part of a movement that is big in Europe, Australia, England, where they have choirs. They're just community choirs. They're not affiliated with any church. All you, and you don't need to know music. All you have to do is have a desire to sing and show up. And they do this in Europe. They've been doing this for a very long time in Europe. And different groups will have uh, their community choir, and they'll go visit another group in another country, like in England. If you're in Bulgaria, you might go to England, teach some of your songs, they'll house you, and then there's a, there's a big festival at the end. Of, and then the next year, if you're, in London, if you're in England, you'll go to Bulgaria maybe, or wherever. So this is something that's been going on for a while, and it's only now starting in the United States. Are you and I'm, that we should travel? I am. <laughs> <laughs> we should travel, yes. But I, I, I had to say this because it, it, it turns out that Maggie and I are pioneers. This is the, this is, yeah, in LA. You know, there's, there's one in Portland now, and there's another one up in Seattle. It's like, it's, it's, it's spreading out. So I, I just had to say that. Um, this is, oh, the, the Ubuntu Choirs Network. Yes, that's in North America. Um, now the next song we're going to sing, with your assistance, is Aye Mochinumba. It means we are all one. Well, in context, it means we are all one. It, word for word, it can also be interpreted as we are number one. So I like both of those together. <laughs> so now, 
the words are very simple, and uh, there are two parts. So, there are four words. Aye, Aye. Mochinumba, Mochinumba. Comere, Comere. Chequere. Chequere. Mochinumba. Mochinumba. So those are the four words. You say Mochinumba twice. And it sounds like this. Aye, Mochinumba. Comere, Chequere, Mochinumba. Aye, Mochinumba. Comere, Chequere, Mochinumba. One more time. Aye, Mochinumba. Comere, Chequere, Mochinumba. Aye, Mochinumba. Comere, Chequere, Mochinumba. So that's part one. Part two is easier. Part yeah. two is easier. Part two is easier because so <laughs> it's some of those words. It's comere. Yeah, yeah, I'll just teach it. So there's comere samba mochi numba, and then there's comere chequere mochi numba. That's all. So it sounds like this comere samba mochi numba, comere chequere mochi numba. Comere samba mochi numba, comere chequere mochi numba. One more time. Comere samba mochi numba, comere chequere mochi numba. Excellent. So now I'm going to give the choir the third part. <laughs> wow. You guys don't have to do this, but if you feel so inclined in your seats, you can go ahead. So. Everybody on samba. Comere samba, mochi numba. Comere chequere, mochi numba. 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 We are all one. And we are number one. <laughs> all right. Well, you may have gathered that here this morning we're talking a lot about how we as secular people can support each other to live better. One of the people that has helped me to live better, to live my values out loud for this past year is my co-host, Bart Campolo. Bart has a long history of building community from the inner cities of Philadelphia and Cleveland, 
and now he builds it mostly among university students in conflict, namely Bruins and Trojans. <laughs> so I give you Bart Campolo. Thank you, Ian. You know, I, it's funny, I was telling you earlier, I, I was, when I was telling you earlier how excited I was to be here, one of the ways I was so excited to be here is I forgot everything I was going to say the first time. But I think I mentioned to you that I was an evangelical Christian for, for 30 years. And I've got to be honest with you, like, I loved being an evangelical Christian, but for all of those 30 years, I never really wanted to proselytize anyone. I, I, I didn't want to do it. And, and I... Honestly, I felt guilty about it. I felt guilty about it because I, I thought I was supposed to, but I just couldn't stand the idea of being some kind of obnoxious zealot, <laughs> pushing my dogma, telling other people what they needed to believe. I loved lots of being Christian, but I couldn't stand the proselytizing part. You know, the funny thing is, is that since I left Christianity and became a secular humanist, I feel exactly the same way. I mean, it ought to be easier now, right? I've got all these, I've got, I've got the same values. I've got the same wonderful values, but, but I have a better narrative. You know, I, I've got a better set of reasons for those values. So, it, I mean, it ought to be easier, but it's still hard to talk about it sometimes. And it's funny, I talk to a lot of secular humanists who say, yeah, it's hard for me to talk about it sometimes with people, especially with my family, especially with my closest friends, especially with my family and close friends who are still believers. You know, and, and it's hard for us to talk sometimes about our values with people who are, who are still believers because we love them and we know it upsets them sometimes and, and, or it scares them or it makes them angry and, and that puts us in an awkward position. And so as I, as I hang around with people like at things like Sunday Assembly or down at, on, on the campuses with the secular students, a lot of them are really concerned. Like, how do I share this stuff? How do I, how do I assert my identity without being a jerk? You know, it, it's, it's funny because, like, what they'll say to me is, I don't want to be an atheist fundamentalist. Can you relate to that? Because you've been around, you've seen, you know atheist fundamentalists, right? They're just as, as anybody else. A number of years ago, back when I lived in Philadelphia one day, I was coming home from work. I ran this urban mission project, and I was, I was on my way home from work, and I was up in North Philadelphia, which is where I worked, and, and I was going home to West Philadelphia, which is where I live, and so I had to get on that Broad Street line, which is the big subway train that runs through Philadelphia, the big underground subway. It's, subway, by the way, is not a sandwich. It's, it's, it's actually a form of transportation. <laughs> so I get on the train, and, and a lot of times when I was riding the subway, public transportation, something probably most of you have never heard of, but it's a thing. Um, <laughs> Public transportation, it's, it's mostly poor people. And in Philadelphia, that means it's mostly black people. And so a lot of times when I run the subway, I'd be the only white guy on the train. And as it was this day, I got on the train, and it didn't matter because nobody's talking to anybody anyway. Everybody's reading their book, reading their newspaper, just in their own little world. And I'm on the subway. And, you know, you get on, and the doors close, and the train takes out of, takes out of the station. I got to the next stop on the, on, on, the, on the subway line, and the doors opened. And this woman got on the, on the car. She was wearing all white. She was all dressed in white. And I mean like white shoes, white pant, white, white hose, white, white dress, white gloves, white hat. And she had a big sign hanging on her, a big sandwich sort of sign on her that said, repent or burn. <laughs> and, and when she got on the train, she didn't sit down. She just, she just grabbed the pole in the middle of the train and she just stood there and the doors closed. And she just started looking around the train. <laughs> and I got really scared. And about five seconds after I put out a station, she, at the top of her lungs, she yelled, this train is going to hell. <laughs> and I remember thinking, like, West Philly's bad, but it's not that bad. <laughs> she went on, she said, this train is going to hell, and you're all going to hell on it. Because you're evil. Because you're evil. And you're going to burn for your sins because you're evil. Unless you repent of your sins, they're going to hell. And she went on like that for a few minutes. And then she paused and she started looking around the train, looking for individual victims. <laughs> you, you, if you've ever seen a street preacher, you know what that's like. They're looking for somebody to talk to. And everybody else in the train was so much smarter than me. Everybody immediately looks down to their book. <laughs> and, she's looking, and, she, and, and she catches me and I'm looking. 
until she, until she picks me. She looks at me and says, you. She says, you. Do you believe in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? And I said what any of you would have said. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I knew that was the right answer. I, I even, I actually embellished it because I came from the church. I was like, washed in the same blood as you are, ma'am. <laughs> she looked at me, she said, no, you're not. <laughs> no, you are not. Because if you were a true Christian, you would be sharing your faith with other people and you would be reading your Bible, not reading your newspaper by yourself. You're evil and you're going to hell. She went on like that until this train reached the next stop. And the doors opened, and as quickly as she had gotten on, she got off the train. And when the doors closed, the entire subway car exhaled at the same moment. <gasps> <laughs> and all of a sudden, we were all best friends. Like, we were all bonded by the experience. Everyone was like, oh, man, that was crazy. Oh, man. And they're all looking at me going, hey, white boy, she really nailed you. And, we, and it's funny, we all started talking. On the train, we all started talking to each other. And everybody, everybody had a story about some zealot in their life. Now, they weren't all religious zealots. I mean, people, some people were telling you, oh, yeah, I have an aunt. Every Thanksgiving, she brings tracks and leaves them on the table. You know? And somebody else said, oh, my gosh, my brother sells Amway. You know, and, and, and they had a story about, you know, he won't leave you alone about it. You always got to be done. And somebody else said, oh, my sister's a vegan. And then, and then we all cried. <laughs> and we all, you know, then we all, that trumped everything, you know. <laughs> and it's funny because as we were all talking about all these zealots in our lives, some of the people on the train, it was interesting. They said, well, you know, it's funny, like, it's kind of embarrassing because I am a Christian. And, and, and somebody else said, yeah, you know, like, I, I'm a vegetarian myself. Like, and he said, yeah, but I, I don't want to, like, but I'm not that kind. I, I don't want to be that way. And we started talking, and this person said, I'm a Christian. And the other person said, what, like, so, so God speaks to you? And this person said, well, it's not exactly like that. It's like when I pray, sometimes I get a sense of being led. And people were like, but, but how does that work? How? And, and then the, the vegetarian person was talking, and people said, like, so you, I mean, do you eat nothing? You no know, meat or, like, or can we do eggs and fish? And, and people are talking to each other. And I'm watching all these people sharing their stories with each other. And I ended up feeling sorry for the lady with the sandwich sign. Because on some level, like, she had been the one who wanted to talk about what we all believe in and what we all care about. And she'd been totally committed to it. I mean, she put herself out there. She was totally committed, but she totally missed the point. And, and, and if you're taking notes, here's the point. <laughs> Nobody cares about your worldview. Nobody cares about your worldview. Nobody cares about your philosophy. Nobody wants to know your theology. But people are really interested in your life. People are really interested in your life. As a matter of fact, they're interested in how you live. And, and, and they're interested in how you live, or at least how you're trying to live. You know what I mean? Like, they're interested, well, what are you after? What are you trying to do here? And what I find is, is that the more they know you, the more interested that they become. I mean, on that train, we didn't know each other very well. We'd had, like, one experience together. And we were mildly interested. But we were talking. But your family, your friends, the people that know you at work, they're really interested in your life because they care about you. I mean, it's funny, all these, all these secular people go like, we need to spread the word. Why isn't our movement growing? Why aren't we, why aren't more people need to know about rational goodness and all this stuff? And the, the, the bottom line is this, is that if you want to spread the good news about secular goodness, you're going to have to make more friends. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about like deep, meaningful. I mean, sometimes it doesn't happen take that long to make friends. We made friends on the subway car. Sometimes you make friends on an airplane. Sometimes you make friends at a bus stop. You just start talking with people about what they're doing, what they're reading, what's going on in the news. But even when you make a friend, even if you make a really good friend, here's the thing I gotta tell you. Even when they're your friend, they're generally not interested in a philosophy lesson. Generally speaking, people aren't interested in your worldview. They're not interested in what you think or believe because they wanna like, 
They want to understand the meaning of the universe from your perspective. <laughs> they want to know what makes you tick. They want to know why you do what you do. You tell them you're into yoga, why do you do yoga? You're in a cab and you're talking to the cabbie and he immigrated from Pakistan. You're like, why'd you come here? What, what, what are you about? You, know, you, you, you meet somebody who's driving Uber and you're like, what, what do you do when you're not driving Uber? Why are, you driving this, why are you driving this car? What are you trying to make the extra money for? I mean, people are interested in what makes you tick and kind of what's your bottom line. You meet somebody who volunteers with Greenpeace. You're like, why? What, what do you care about? You meet somebody who's into yoga. How'd you get going on that? You meet somebody who goes to Sunday assembly and you're like, What's that all about? See, most of the time, people want to know what makes you tick, and i got to be honest with you. They want it in 100 words or less. <laughs> right? Can, I, can, I, can anybody, right? They want it in 100 words or less. Yeah, some of you want it. I want it in 100 words or less, and you're over. <laughs> so what I'm here to tell you is, is that if you want to, if you want to be able to share with people your identity, if you, want, if you want to be able to take a stand for what you really believe in, you don't need a lecture. You need an elevator speech. Right? You need an elevator speech. And, and honestly, you know, people say, like, why, do you call, why aren't you the atheist chaplain? The reason I don't call myself the atheist chaplain at USC is because for my elevator speech, atheist is way too distracting. Atheist is way too in your face. I, first thing I want you to know is I don't believe what you believe. It's distracting, and the truth is, it doesn't answer the question. People want to know why you do what you do. It, I don't do one thing in my life because I don't believe in God. That's not a motivation for me for anything. Oh, because I don't believe in God? No. No, you know, if you want to know why I do what I do, I'll give you my elevator speech. I always say to people, look, I became convinced at some point in my life that this life was the only life I had. And that's, that's what's one of your taglines here at Sunday Summit. This is the only, you know, this is the one life we're sure we've got. I said, this was the only life I had. And, and what I decided was, is that I wanted to make the most of my life. You want to know why I, why I do what I do? Because I want to make the most of this life. And I've done enough research to, like, and you say, what does that mean? It means I want to be happy. I want to be joyful. I want to experience this life. When I'm done, I want to feel like I really did it, and I really loved it, and I sucked the marrow out of the experience, and I've come to the conclusion that if you want to be happy, the same three things lead to happiness for just about everybody. I've read all those happiness studies. I've, I've read all those psychological studies, and it always boils down to the same three things. The people that die satisfied with their lives are the people that say, I had loving relationships. It's never the people that are the most successful or the richest. It's the ones who say, I had I had, loving, I had loving relationships. And, and, then, and then they say, and I did things with my life that I felt like were meaningful, that made the world better for other people. I contributed somehow. That's important to people. And the other thing is, the people that end their lives happy always seem to say, I cultivated a sense of wonder. I, I, cultivated, a sense of, I, I cultivated a sense of gratitude. I realized that this life the ability to see and think and feel and sing, that this life is an incredible privilege. It, it may not be given by anybody, but it's still a gift. And I cultivated that, and I loved this life. I loved the universe. I loved the nature. I loved the science. I love how it works. Yeah, that's my elevator speech. I said, look, I wanted to make the most of my life. I wanted to be happy, and I figured out that the, the way to be happy is to, is to spend your time cultivating loving relationships and making it possible for other people to do the same, and so that's why I do what I do. That's why I do the yoga. That's why I, that's why I try to eat healthy, because somehow it connects with building loving relationships. Now, I've got to be honest with you. That's not bad, isn't it? <laughs> right? I mean, like that, I've I, I got I to tell you, it works for my people. Worse with my family, worse with my friends. But I got to tell you something. If you really want to communicate, you're going to need more than a speech. You're going to need more than a speech, especially with believers. Because they won't care that you're happy in your brain. They're convinced that you're not happy in your life. Because you don't have what they have. Because what they have is not just a talk. They have a collective embodiment of their values. See, you, when I was a Christian, I didn't say to people, let me t show you my theology. I was like, let me bring you to my church. Let me show you my people. These are me and my friends. This is what we do together. This is what we say, say together. This is how we sing together. This is who we are. I, the way I communicated what I believed in was by the group I was a part of. You, you've heard that phrase, a picture is worth a thousand words. You're trying to communicate secular goodness? Look around. A picture is worth a thousand words. 
here we all are. See, that's what a community like this is good for, at least for me. When it comes time to communicate with my, my family, especially my Christian family members, what I'm about, when, when, I, when I tell them about what we do at USC with the Secular Student Fellowship, when I tell them about the, the, way, the kind of things we talk about, the last conversation we had, the last speaker we had, when I tell them about the kids going off on some service project together, they go, ah, oh, I recognize that. It sounds like, yeah, or synagogue. But I got to be honest with you, you don't just need a community for them. The truth of the matter is I think we need it for ourselves. I mean, it's not, it's, not that I, 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 it's not that I'm a part of a community so that I can show other people what I'm about. The truth of the matter is, is that I have a set of values and it is incredibly hard for me to live them out. It is difficult to live better. It is difficult to want to keep helping people. It is difficult to stay wondering at the amazement of the universe when I just got a parking ticket. <laughs> it's hard to live up to our values. And what I would suggest to you from my sociological studies is it's virtually impossible for anyone to live up to their values alone. Human beings are pack animals. And to the degree that we live up to our values, we live up to our collective values. And that's why a community like this one can be really helpful to people. Because this is a place where we can live out our values together. I mean, I would love to clean up the bay, but I'm not going to do it until the little girl gets up here, and then I'm ready to go. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I mean, I mean, didn't she make you want to be a better person? <laughs> and that's why we're here. That's why we sing. That's why we bring in speakers to give us ideas about, hey, if the brain works this way, we can have a better relationship if we do that. Hey, if, if social science tells us this about the way people are motivated, if we want to motivate them to help other people or to do something for the homeless or, or just to experience a greater sense of wonder, we should do it this way. And you say, yeah, that's, that's all good and well, but I have a lot of friends. And I want to be real clear with you this morning. I am not talking about friends. Because the truth of the matter is everybody I know in L.A. has lots of friends. <laughs> You got friends over here, you got friends over there. We all, everybody's got lots of friends, but the traffic is so bad you never see them. <laughs> and what's more is, most of, us have ne most of us have collections of friends, and our friends don't know our other friends. Our friends don't know each other. So we're like a hub, and we've got spokes out here, and I know this person, I know that person, and they're all great. And what I'm telling you is, friends are great, but if your friends don't know each other, then it requires too much work for you to share who you really are with all of them one at a time. A community is not just where you have a lot of friends, it's where all of your friends are in common. Where you know, everybody knows everybody together, and so you can talk about each other. <laughs> I mean, that's what we do, right? No, 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 no don't, don't get me wrong, don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about gossip. See, because what a, the difference between gossip and what a, a real community does is when a real community gets together, they're not gossiping. They're talking with a purpose in mind. So they say, hey, did you hear about Joe? He lost his job. Oh, my gosh, what are we... Do you know somebody that could help him with that? Did you hear about Mary? She's moving on Saturday. Oh, I didn't know that. You know, we should get a bunch of people together to help Mary move. Did you hear about Sally? Her, her father died. We should, we should cook some casseroles and we should get over there. You say, well, that's what church people do. Yeah. It has nothing to do with believing. It has to do with family. See, the difference between a bunch of friends and a community is that a community is a lot more like a family. So what do you mean? Well, a family gets together naturally, whether they want to or not. <laughs> right? It's Thursday. We have to go to mom's house for dinner, right? It's, you know, and you say, well, what do you mean? That's what this is. See, there are a bunch of people that are here this morning, and they didn't want to come. <laughs> they didn't want to come. They got up. They didn't feel like it, but they're responsible for the coffee tray. <laughs> or they said they would be at the table. Or they promised me they would be here, right? And so they showed up out of obligation. And you say, well, that's what I'm trying to avoid. That's why I got out of religion. I didn't want any obligation. Well, the problem is, is that obligation responsibility to one another, those are the things that bind together a community. It's, it's, 
when you're bound together that way, what that means is you care about each other. That means when one person hurts, everybody shares the pain. And when one person's joyful, when one guy celebrates three weeks sobriety, and you don't even really know that guy that well, was anybody else excited this morning? It's those obligations. It's that sense of responsibility. It's that showing up, whether you feel like it or not. That's what makes a community a family, and that's what makes a community transformative. That's what makes it into the kind of thing that somebody says, like Shemuel did. Shemuel did. This changed my life. This made my life better. Didn't fix everything, but it made my life better. I, 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 I'm about out of time. I just got one more story to tell you. First, uh, I just, it's just a story I like to tell because it's true, unlike most of the stories I tell. Um, <laughs> the first non-religious, I, I was in churches forever. The first non-religious community I was ever a part of was in Cincinnati, Ohio. It was, I, my wife and my family and I, we were living in this intentional community in this very rough inner city neighborhood in Cincinnati. And we had we created this kind of fellowship. We called it the Walnut Hills Fellowship. That was the name of the, the neighborhood. And we had dinner together every, uh, every Monday night. We would get a bunch of neighbors together. And I mean, I, I was the one who went out in the streets and made friends with all of our neighbors and invited them to dinner. And so, but you know, a, after a while, I mean, it was this motliest crew of people. It was people like my family, nice, you know, working people doing stuff. And then we would have homeless people and you know, dealers and kids fall off the street and, you know, all, all sorts of rugged people from our neighborhood. And we all had dinner together every Monday night. And uh, one of the guys in that dinner, one of the guys who became one of my closest friends was a, a guy up the street. His name was Danny. If you knew anybody in Walnut Hills, everybody knew Danny. Because Danny was this kind of character in our neighborhood. He, he, he was a rough dude. I mean, I got to know him. I got to know him on the street. We would just sit around talking, and he would be drinking, and I would be drinking a Coke, and we would be talking. And it turned out Danny had been stabbed three times. He'd been shot three times. He'd been in and out of prison. He'd been in and out of jail. I mean, he'd been, he'd been in and out of homeless shelters. He was homeless half the time. His mother was a prostitute. His dad was a John. He had been raised. He had been, he had been basically out on his own since he was 12 years old on the streets of this rough ghetto. I mean, he was awful. And when I say he had scars, I mean he had scars. But he used to come to dinner with us. And gradually he made friends with everybody. And everybody liked Danny. In fact, everybody liked Danny so much. I liked Danny especially. And, and one of the things about Danny was is that he was, he was homeless. And especially when it would get cold and you would know he was out there in the streets, it started to bother me. It started to bother my wife. It started to bother our friends. Danny, he's our friend. You shouldn't let your friend be homeless. I mean, it's one thing, the homeless problem of our city. But it's another thing, it was a guy you know, he eat dinner with every, every Monday night. And, and so he's homeless. And so I, I used to go to him and say, Danny, there's this HUD program. I'll fill out the paperwork for you, because I knew he, he, was, he, he struggled with reading and writing. I said, I can fill out the paperwork. I said, it only costs 25 bucks a month to get an apartment in this program, if, you, if you're a no-income person. And he said, no, Bart, I can't do that. I don't, I don't want the responsibility. I can't handle that. He said, I can't handle anything like that. I'll screw it up. He was so afraid to fail. So he was out there. One night at dinner, we were having dinner together, and I, um, just like at dinner, just like you guys do here, we had people give talks, and I was giving the talk that day, and I told this story that probably you all know. I, I, told, I, was, I was trying to illustrate some point. I told the story of Blonde and the Tightrope Walker. Yes? You don't know the story. Oh, it's a really good story. I, I don't have time to tell it to you. But the bottom line is, no, Charles Blondin, first guy to walk on a tightrope across the uh, Niagara Falls, right? Yeah, like, in, like way, way back, okay? And, and it was illegal to do it at the time. So what happened was he strung the tightrope in the middle of the night. He and his friends did. And he got out on the tightrope before the sun came up so that when the sun came up and everybody noticed he was out there, the authorities couldn't do anything about it. Like, what are you going to do? Like, get off of there! It's dangerous! You know? So... So they left him up there, and he, and he walked across. And of course, as he's walking across, the word went out in Canada and the United States that Blondin was on the tightrope, and, and crowds gathered on each side. And when the crowd gathered, he walked from the American side to the Canadian side, and there was this huge crowd gathered on the Canadian side when he got there. And I, and I, I, you know, I was telling the story to the group at dinner, and I said, and said when Blondin got there, the crowd erupted into cheers. And it's true. I mean, you can read up on it. What? Crowds cheering. And they all started cheering, you know, Blondin, Blondin, Blondin. And he silenced the crowd. He said, I am Blondin. 
It seemed really obvious at that point, but <laughs> he said, I'm Blondin, do you believe in me? And the crowd chanted back, we believe, we believe, we believe. He silenced him again, he said, do you believe I can walk back across the tightrope? And the crowd in a frenzy said, we believe, we believe, we believe. He silenced them one last time, he said, do you believe I can walk back across the tightrope with a man suspended on my shoulders? They said, we believe, we believe. He said, which one of you will be that man? <laughs> and the crowd fell silent. <laughs> no, seriously, and out of the crowd, one guy stepped forward. Turned out it was Blondin's business manager. Um, <laughs> saw the whole thing going down. Uh, climbed on his back. For the next three and a half hours, Blondin inched his way back to the other side of the tightrope. Now, now, now listen, you, you know why I was telling that story. I was telling that story because I was telling this group, and what I, you know, the point of the story is really obvious. I said, the point of the story is, everybody said they believed, but how many really believed? One guy. I said, because to really believe in something, to really have a conviction, is not simply to intellectually assent to it, it's to live it out. Now that whole, that's not a religious point. That's just true. You, you, you know, what you do is what you really believe. Everything else is just talk. So I was making that point. And so I'm telling that story, and Danny's there, and everybody's listening, and, but at the point at which, I, with the, which the crowd's going, blonde in, blonde in, I can see Danny was really into the story. And I said, you know, wouldn't that be neat? Wouldn't that be fun to have people chanting your name? And everyone's like, yeah, yeah. I said, Danny, wouldn't you like that? He said, yeah. And so I said to the crowd, let's do it. And so I got Danny up. I, I had him sitting on a chair in front of the room. And I said, let's do it, everybody. And everybody started doing it. Like, they all started chanting, Danny, Danny, Danny. And, and, and then the crowd got louder, you know? I mean, wouldn't you like that, Ian, they did that? <laughs> Would you like that? Could you just, just for a second, could you give Ian a thrill? Just start real quiet. Okay, you ready? Louder. Louder. Okay, stop. Was it good? Of course it was. Okay, so we did this for Danny. We did this for Danny. And I gotta tell you something, you gotta remember, this guy has never been anywhere. He's never had anyone on his side. And all of a sudden, all of his friends in the neighborhood are chanting, Danny, Danny. He stood up off the chair, and he put his hands out, and closed his eyes, and he just drank it in. And they were yelling, Danny, Danny. And he just was like this. And, and, and he was just, he just held it in. And when it was finally over, he sat down. And it was, so, it was just neat. <laughs> Dinner was over and cleaned up. Took everything home, put it away. Martin and I went home and we went to bed that night. Next morning, 8 o'clock in the morning, it's a knock on my door. I open it up, it's Danny. He says, I'm ready for that apartment now. Yeah. Yeah, there's no magic, friends. There's no woo, there's no supernaturalism involved in the story. <clears throat> See, what I'm telling you is, is that when I tell that story to my Christian friends, they understand what I'm talking about. Because what that story is about, it's about how you need a community, not only to live out your own values, but you need a community if you want to be able to transform somebody's life who's broken. See, loving broken people is a team sport. None of us can handle it. People wear us out. But if you bring them here, you can pass them around. <laughs> I'm going to say it plain and then I'm done. If you want people to know who you are, as a secularly wonderful person. If you want them to understand what you really believe in, it's not so, you don't need to have lots and lots of words, you just need an elevator speech and a community that's actually changing your life for the better. I hope that's this community for some of you. And if this isn't your community, I hope you can go find one. And if you can't go find one, I hope you'll go make one. Because the truth of the matter is, is the world does need to understand that just because somebody doesn't believe in God doesn't mean they don't believe in love and meaning and purpose and value. And the only way to communicate that is together. Thanks so much.
that, he knows he can do it. <laughs> so Bart mentioned during that talk that a picture is worth a thousand words. I wish you guys had the picture that I have standing up here seeing this sea of people that is my community. So one of the things that we do when we gather in communities, we always take a couple of minutes of quiet reflection. This is a time that I hope you know that you're in a safe space, that you're among friends, and we're gonna take about two minutes to just be with your own thoughts, all right? Well, that was wonderful, Bart, wherever you are. Uh, we're going we're gonna to end this day with a song by Pat Humphreys called We're Going to Keep On Moving Forward. About 30 years ago, I was at a, a, an art and uh, music retreat, and there was a songwriting class that was going on there, and Pat Humphreys was participating in it. And at the end of the week, all these musicians sort of got together and shared what they had been working on, and she sang this song in this room full of unsuspecting, happy people. And uh, you could really feel in that moment that this song had wings. And you felt the room change when she shared it. And it is a song now that has traveled from here to, I don't know, the farthest place that it's, that it's reached. But a lot of people know and sing this song. It's a really beautiful song. And when Bart and I were talking about this, these, these members of the Golden Bridge Choir coming today, he, he, he mentioned the song, and I said, oh, I know it, and we love it so much. So this is, we're gonna keep on moving forward, and you'll see uh, the, the verses change, the choir comes in when they come in, and at some point, I hope you'll join us. We're gonna keep on moving forward. We're gonna keep on moving forward. We're gonna keep on moving forward. Never turning back. Never turning back. We're gonna keep on walking proudly we're gonna keep on walking proudly we're gonna keep on walking proudly never turning back never turning back we're gonna keep on singing loudly 
gonna keep on singing loudly. We're gonna keep on singing loudly. Never turning back. Never turning back. We're gonna keep on loving boldly. We're gonna keep on loving boldly. We're gonna keep on loving boldly. Never turning back. Never turning back. We're gonna reach across our borders. We're gonna reach across our borders. We're gonna reach across our borders, never turning back, never turning back. We're gonna keep on moving forward. We're gonna keep on moving forward. We're gonna keep on moving forward. Never turning back, never turning back. So I'd like to give a big thanks to Maggie and the Golden Bridge Choir, and the Sunday Assembly Choir. Thank you guys very much. I'd also like to give a thanks to Bart and everybody else, Schwell, and everybody else who was a part of today's assembly. But most of all, most of all, I'd like to thank you. I'd like to thank you all for coming.